So uh, that was quite an opening discussion. And uh, Arthur and Josh and Jim did a great job in setting the stage for these issues. And, and uh, I want to introduce myself again. I'm Robert Doerr. I'm the Mortgage Fellow in Poverty Studies here at AEI. I am here largely because of Arthur Brooks's commitment to helping the poor and making sure that AEI is, is in that battle and in that discussion as aggressively as possible. And I'm here today because Josh Good has been such a great friend to me as I've joined AEI. So that was the discussion that can really get us into even more detailed and more practical as we get on. I come from the government world, so I'll be wanting to talk about specific policies and how they relate to our two next guests' views of what we need to do to help Americans' low-income population. So on my left, I have Byron Johnson. He's from the Baylor Institute for, uh, for Studies of Religion. He is a distinguished professor of social science at Baylor, Baylor University. And I'm a big believer in very short introductions. Your, his bio is in the book. And I think he's well known to many people in this audience. The same is also true for Bob Woodson, who is the founder and president of the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. Bob is an AEI alumni, and we always love to have alumni back in the house. Uh, and he has been, most recently, uh, really an inspirer and an instigator and an, uh, of some of the things that have come out of Congressman Ryan and his efforts to put forth a new agenda for helping the poor in America from the right. So Byron, Bob, welcome. We're glad you're here for this important discussion. And so I wanted to ask my first question and just sort of get the conversation going and give you an opportunity to, to get started. And, and uh, Byron, I think I'll start with you. Is um, In listening to that discussion, we talked about aspirational uh, and visionary and hope, hope. We didn't get all that practical. As we go forward in thinking of things that we can do that are practical, either through government or through civic society or corporate world, what are some things you want to make sure we avoid? And what are things you would want to make sure we do? Where, where are the lines of engagement for you, Byron? And then Bob will ask you the same question. Yeah, maybe I should start with what we should do. OK. Um, uh, I run a think tank at Baylor University. And um, as a part of that work, I do a lot of work uh, study on programs, typically faith-based programs that work on the issues that were discussed in the first session. And um, for example, Bob Woodson, who shares the, the panel with me today, is the subject of a number of studies that we've done. Um, and uh, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about Bob's work. I hope he will. Um, Bob uh, is a social entrepreneur, as was mentioned earlier. And um, he can, he'll talk at length about the work that they're doing. We have a new study coming out uh, on the violence-free zone, uh, which is one of a number that we've done that show the incredible impact that that organization is having in some of our uh, most disadvantaged communities. But just in the last two years, um, we've completed a number of studies. And I just wanted to highlight some of them, because I think this is, a, this is what we can do. Uh, one of the studies is on something called the Prison Entrepreneurship Program. Um, and Jim Wallace is correct to say that left and right have come together in some surprising ways here recently to talk about issues around um, incarceration and, and sentencing reform that have been needed for a long time. So it's, it's, it's a very positive thing to see that development. But the Prison Entrepreneurship Program uh, started in Houston, Texas. This is a program where uh, business leaders mentor prisoners. They go into prisons, identify inmates with entrepreneurial leanings. They, they mentor them over time while they're in prison, help them create job plans, business plans, and then help them start businesses when they get out of prison. Colleges all across the country are involved, both faith-based and secular. In, in fact, a number of Ivy League schools are, are participating in the prison entrepreneurship program. It's a faith-based program, although they would not even call themselves faith-based, just like Bob doesn't necessarily call uh, the Violence Free Zone a faith-based program. But if you go to any of their trainings, believe me, it's like a tent revival. Um, I don't know how you, yeah, I don't know how you could get much more faith-based uh, than their uh, efforts. But they're they're actually pretty wise about how they they cast themselves out there. So, ditto, ditto for the Prison Entrepreneurship Program. So I've been hearing about this program for a long time, completely private funded. You have these business leaders going into prisons, taking inmates, 
and creating business plans and not only job openings, for some of them, their own businesses. This is a complete paradigm shift from what we've talked about before with prisoner reentry. Um, so we've done an ROI analysis, return on investment, kind of a cost benefit analysis of that program, and it's stunning. Here you have prisoners now that are actually employed, paying taxes, paying child support. Some of them are av actually having their families reunited as a result of what's happened to them in this program. Uh, many of them come to faith, and that's a big part of it. All of these business leaders are people of faith, by the way. Uh, there's one common theme that emerges from all the work that we're doing, and it's these entrepreneurs are faith-based. Uh, these are not secular entrepreneurs. I, I wrote a book a few years ago called More God, Less Crime, and an atheist society asked me to come out and give a keynote talk to them. Why, I don't know, and why I accepted, I don't know. Um, it certainly wasn't a love fest. It was three hours of grueling debate with atheists. And the interesting thing is, at the end of it, um, they had actually moved a lot towards uh, my direction, and they wanted to know how I could help them do work among atheists to help them volunteer more, uh, because they realized that they weren't in the trenches uh, like so many of the religious people were doing all the heavy lifting. The Interchange Freedom Initiative is a faith-based program that works within prisons. Um, Serve West Dallas is um, uh, something I'll just talk briefly about. Um, Serve West Dallas, if any of you have ever been to West Dallas in the 1980s, it was, had the largest housing project uh, in America. Uh, a, a blighted community right there next to the skyline of Dallas. And a pastor there, African-American pastor, could not wait to leave West Dallas. As soon as he turned 18, he signed up for the military. He was, and then he, after that, he became a Christian and, and realized that he was being called back to West Dallas. And according to him, God had given him a vision of going back and seeing spiritual and physical transformation in West Dallas. That was 1980. He's been at it ever since. It's taken 30 years, but we're now seeing dramatic changes in West Dallas. One of the problems that we have to realize is that these, some of our problems are so serious, they're not going to be licked overnight. And so, um, and I'll give you a website shortly so you can see the study that we've completed on West Dallas, but this pastor created a consortium of groups, mainly faith-based, but not all faith-based. Um, and these groups have met different needs in that community, whether it's after-school programming, or whether it's job training, uh, whether it's family counseling, you name it, they have a ministry that's geared towards that. They've worked with government in unique partnerships, and they've worked with churches, urban and rural, together uh, to tackle some of these difficult issues. It's only in the last six years that some of the more pronounced changes have been evident, though. It takes time. It's, take, it's been very difficult, by the way, to hold that consortium of groups together. They've all kind of wanted to go their own way, but they've found strength if they stick together. And that's one of the other problems that you see in so many of our blighted communities, is that successful programs are here and there, but we've not been able to help tie those all together. And uh, so um, if, they, if they stumble and fall, uh, then we have a problem. So. Um, Serve West Dallas is an interesting study in what can happen in a community. Um, there's a, something called the House here in Washington, D.C. We're getting ready to launch a study here next month on that uh, that's working with at-risk youth. And I could go on. Um, so there are exciting things happening out there. Not enough, uh, but people who are sensitive to what I would call Bob a calling on their life. Um, are responding, and when they do respond, we're finding some effect. So I'm not an entrepreneur. I just do studies of people that are. And the exciting thing is um, we're beginning to see some effects, and we publish these things in academic journals, 
And then we also try to write essays that are more popular that everyday people can get exposed to. So there's good news out there. Uh, we're making some progress. The, the latest study that we're working on is, uh, and, and Jim Wallace actually alluded to a part of this, is a movement to build Bible colleges within prisons. Ultimately, that's not our answer. We want to we want to fix the train before they get to prison. Okay, but and we're doing a lot with kids, and and, and there are some early intervention programs um, that can help there. But this new seminary movement is quite interesting. Um, so we're doing a study in Angola, Louisiana, once known as the bloodiest prison in America, uh, that's been transformed over the last 20 years. Um, and many people think it's a Bible college that's changed that prison, and we have a major grant to study uh, the effects of that college. We're now two years into a three-year study, and we have some early findings that are both stunning, exciting, um, but it's not quite as sexy as you'd think. Um, it, it's, it's more complicated than you start a Bible college, uh, and it fixes everything in a prison. Uh, the culture has changed dramatically there, but we're criminologists, social scientists, and we like to see what all is going on. And one of the things that we know is that the prison is markedly older than it was 20 years ago. And when people are older, they don't fight as much and are much less likely to kill each other. So there's, there is some age effect that's going on. But there's a church in the prison, and this is what's interesting, Bob. There are 27 congregations in that prison. That wasn't always the case with pastors and staff. And you may think, this doesn't sound possible. It's very unusual. This is a prison, maximum security with over 6,000 prisoners. These congregations started in the 1950s, uh, long before the Bible College started. And these are largely African-American congregations. Uh, back then, whites wouldn't go to church in that prison. Uh, now there are white churches, black churches, and mixed churches. Um, and so we're studying the effect of the church within the prison to see how that's changed uh, so much of what we see there, where the violence rate has dropped off to almost zero. Um, so it's an interesting thing, and, and evangelicals, I, I'm, I'm one of them. Um, we love solutions, right? The problem with evangelicals is we have no discipline. Uh, so the instant we hear about something, we do it. And so now there are prison seminaries all across the country, and no one even knows if they really work or don't. Uh, this, so anytime you hear about an exciting program, everyone's ready to replicate it, but we haven't done our due diligence to see what it is that's working or not working. It could be that some of the parts of the program are actually counterproductive and harmful. The other parts are so dramatic, it, it trumps it. But these are things that social science can help us understand. And so that's what we want to do. I mean, uh, in California, they're doing their seminaries now for short-termers, people that are going to get out with the hopes that they would be urban pastors. Well, it doesn't take rocket science to figure out if one of these guys gets out of prison with a seminary degree um, and they do something tragic, that the whole movement would be shot down because of one incident. And, and so I just think that this we need to be um, you know, realistic about these things and move forward, but to do so in a way that is evidence-based. And that's one, and I, as I stop here uh, to hand the, the ball off to, to Bob, I think that's one of the things I most appreciate, Bob, is not just the great work that he's been doing for so many years, but that he's, he's, he's willing to be exposed. Come look at us. Come see if what we do works. And that's, that's exactly what we've been doing. Um, n not all faith-based groups are open to that exposure. Uh, I know because I've tried to study them for the last 30 years, and a lot of them say, we don't need you to come tell us what we do works. And I say, well, you may not meet, need me, but you need somebody because you need to be accountable. Uh, and you can't use all these scriptures that you fall back on to all the time to say, you know, you're accountable to God and nobody else. But, um, so I'm a big believer in evidence. And uh, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and let my good friend Bob chat. Bob, how do we make it practical? Well, I, uh, I consider myself, my, my ideology is a radical pragmatist. I'm a cardiac Christian, <laughs> cardiac Christian, uh, but a radical pragmatist. And I think in talking about poverty, I think we generalize too much. Not everybody is poor for the same reason. 
I've identified four categories of poor people. The first category are people who just broke. They don't have any money. There's been their characters intact. They have the death of a significant breadwinner or a death, uh, uh, illness in the family or factory has moved away. They use the welfare system the way it was intended as an ambulance service, not as a transportation system, as a bridge over troubled times. The second category is like the young woman in Milwaukee some years ago who was a single mom on welfare, again, whose character is intact. Um, she saved $5,000 from her welfare check to send her daughter to college, and when the system found out about it, she was charged with a felony, and she was arrested and went to court. So she concluded that there are too many disincentives to be independent, so she'll just stay on welfare. Then you got the third category of people just physically or mentally disabled. But the fourth category is the one that concerns most of us, and that is people who are poor because of the chances that they take and the choices that they make. There is a moral uh, decline or degeneration in their life. There's a crisis of character. And just giving money to them uh, injures them with the helping hand. But I think people on the left tend to look at all poor people as if they're category one. And people on the right tend to look at the poor as if they're all category four. And so we miss one another when we're trying to construct remedies. Uh, and so uh, the center that I have founded 34 years ago, we concentrate exclusively on people in category four because we believe that, that the, uh, poverty uh, among category four is a crisis of the spirit and there's a character crisis, just giving them. So, but we also know that, that, the, that Bill Bennett said it best, when people on the left look at poor, they see a sea of victims and people on the right see a sea of aliens. And so it is most important to, and Arthur said something that's very important. We don't talk to people in category four as if they're adults. In fact, I've had some uh, liberals say to me, oh, you, you're, you're really insensitive to expect them to conform to the norms of society. You're being, you're doing insensitive. And so what we believe that you must do that's why the word enterprise is in our name. We believe the principles that operate in our market economy should operate in our social economy. In our market economy, we know that most of the jobs are generated by just 3% of the population. Those are the entrepreneurs, and they generate most of the job. Entrepreneurs tend to be C students, not A students. A students come back uh, to universities and, uh, and teach C students in Dow. <laughs> because very smart people have to have all the answers before they act, and when they act, the opportunity's gone. But C students, like myself, we're able to act in the presence of our doubts and uncertainties, and if we fail, we just bounce back and try it again. If we fail, we come back. Well, I regard what we do at the Center for David Enterprise, looking at, we go into low-income neighborhoods and we look for people are, uh, that are, are uh, two types. I call them Josephs. People that are raising children that are not dropping out of school, they're not in jail and drugs, they are the 30%. We go among those and ask, what is it that you are doing that's different than your neighbors? Those are the social entrepreneurs. That once we find them, we apply miracle Grow in terms of training and, and, and access to capital. And so we look at these as antibodies. But what the traditional social service uh, poverty industry does is we, 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 we design remedies for the poor with these $15 trillion we spent over 50 years. And then we parachute well-intended but misguided remedies for the poor. We parachute it into those communities with the expectation that the poor participate. And if they fail, we don't examine the intervention. We assume that people are worse off than we thought. Since 70% of all dollars spent on the poor goes to a professional service provider, we have, play, we have made a commodity out of poor people, where there are disincentives for them to achieve. OK, what do we do with this? There are two types of people that I know. In Joseph in the Bible, I have a book called The Triumphs of Joseph. That's a commercial. Um, <laughs> Because Joseph is a man who was faithful in his burdens and in his blessings. He, he was in the house of Potiphar, but not of it. 
He was in Pharaoh's prisons, but not of it. He was in Pharaoh's court, but not of it. He, and so we, and there are two types of Joseph. They are the Josephs of, 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 of Genesis, who was blameless, but, but he never defined himself as a victim. When he met with Pharaoh, he didn't ask for reparations. And, and then there was the Pharaoh, uh, the Josephs that, are, that, that succumbed to their environment and became prostitutes and drug addicts and thieves and cutthroats. But through God's grace, they have been transformed and redeemed. So we go into low-income neighborhoods and we look for these two types of Joseph. These are the people, and they are the ones who have the solutions to the problems. And so what we must do is insinuate resources, training like we do with regular entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs, t commercial entrepreneurs, tend to be very poor bookkeepers. So a venture capitalist brings not only capital, but training so that the entrepreneur can grow from a single operation out of a kitchen to a Fortune 500 company. What we need to do as a practical basis is go into these low-income neighborhoods when we're looking for answers to fatherhood and whatnot. Let's go among the people suffering the problem and find out what is it that they have created and we have found some marvelous we, uh, 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 solutions that have coaches can be surrogate fathers. These men coming out of prison who God's can be surrogate fathers. And so what we've got to do, though, is remove the constraints, uh, the, the regulations, also provide the means for them to go and engage with these, these and build. And we have examples of where there are centers of excellence within the most rundown, drug-infested neighborhood. The problem is the qualities that make them effective makes them invisible because people are, tend not to go in, and invest in institutions that are indigenous. What we do is parachute in. KIPP schools and Teach America are examples, are well-intended, and they do have, but they're not indigenous to the community suffering the problem. But it's easier to get funding when institutions are created by the sons and daughters of white wealthy people. But we cannot take any of that money and invest it in institutions indigenous to those communities so that people can be the agents of their own transformation. The most insulting thing in the world is to treat a person as if they're an impotent child. I tell people I'd rather be hated than patronized. Mm -hmm. yes, indeed. And what most of us do is patronize. And finally, I would add, I must disagree with uh, 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 Jim on the issue of racism in the gym, criminal justice system. That is just not the case. And, and, and continued emphasis on race is destroying us because it's bringing about police and court nullification. Most of those young blacks coming to jail are coming, being convicted, arrested by a black cop, tried by a black jury, sentenced by a black judge, where they go to prison, where they're supervised by a black guard. And so it is important for us to, to, to move beyond this. But let me just stop at that point and, and maybe well, move to the next. No, I, I, I want to follow up on something you said. I'm going to come back to Bob and then go to you, Byron. And that is the phrase injures, injures with a helping hand. And also in the previous panel, there was a discussion about listening to the people we're trying to serve and finding out what they want. Sometimes um, in running government programs, sometimes what people say they want isn't exactly what um, the government program uh, mandates. And that comes most clear in, with regard to responsibility requirements or work requirements in return for assistance. And I wanted to ask both of you, because it did, for someone who ministered these programs, it seemed so occasionally uncharitable to say to someone, that I want to help you, but I need you to do something. And if you don't, I may have to cut your benefits. How do you react as a Christian to that? I'm, uh, I believe that, that that's the right thing. Expectation in the absence of opportunity is oppression. It's fine to have expectation, but you must provide the means for people to meet that expectation. And if they don't, they should f feel the sanctions. They should be sanctioned. And so I think it's, it's, it's respecting people to have high expectations, and they need to suffer the consequence of their failure to meet those expectations. But you must give them an opportunity to meet it. That's where I do. Byron, do you want to comment on that idea of expectations and responsibility and when you do have to 
take a position that is that may sound uncharitable, but may in the long run be in the best interest of the community? Well, that's way out of my area of expertise, oh. you know? Um, you're asking me, I, I, I would, you know, probably be in, in Bob's uh, camp on, on that kind of a response. Um, and, and this isn't what you're asking, um, but, but I'll go there anyway, and that is, I do think that um, there's room for, for partnerships uh, with government programs. Yeah. And um, I think sometimes in discussions like the ones we're having today, um, the idea is the church can fix everything. Right. And that, then there's the, also the idea that the government can fix everything. And uh, so uh, people on the right, small government, people on the left, big government, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I tell people in faith-based uh, areas is that if you can do it without government funding, do it. But I'm not going to begrudge anyone that wants to partner with the government, because I think some of our problems are so serious, we have to have these partnerships. And so I, I wrote a piece um, uh, not too long ago, you can get it on our website, not by faith or government alone, that probably offends everybody. Um, but. <laughs> It basically says that these partnerships are needed, both secular, public, private. This is where Bob, I think, you know, again, he's been out there in the wilderness for so long um, talking about these things, trying to get businesses to invest. Um, uh, I think these are the right things to do. Um, I mean, we've seen so much flight, and again, we've focused on race, but um, now we want businesses investing in these communities. And I think, Bob, the thing that, he, that he's done that's so brilliant is he's gone to the communities where the transformation is needed but looked for answers already in the communities, you know? And, and so that, we're, you know, we're not bringing this in to fix you. We're going to find what's working here, and we're going to help expand it and build it. And um, I think that's, that's how you sustain something. So um, I'm all for partnerships, and one of the things that, that I'm seeing when I go across the country is there is an openness now from people in the government, like yourself formerly, to people of faith, in the faith communities. I had the sheriff of LA saying, we need the faith community to help us. I'm sitting on a time bomb. Uh, you know, we've cut everything. We, we don't have any more programs, and um, we need the faith community. So for the first time, there's the, this window of opportunity for communities of faith, I think, to, to be leaders. And I think many of them have been there, but like, like Bob, they haven't, they haven't been up front and center like they need to be. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that these partnerships can be really synergistic. And it also helps government, if they have myths and stereotypes about what faith communities are about, to work with them because most of those myths get blown out of the water. They think they're all about evangelism and evangelism only. And a lot of these uh, places, um, evangelism is something that drives them, but that's not, what, not, that's not their first cup of tea. And um, so I think that the, the more we see this, and I think people of faith have abandoned the government sometimes too. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's seen as a bad thing the government is evil, we don't want to work with the government, so we abandon the government. And so as an evangelical, I would say people of faith need to be in the government, okay? Bring the light into the government, and I think that also is transformative. I, I went to a, a prison in, um, out west, it was in a cornfield, it was either Iowa or Kansas, I can't remember. And um, they had started a faith-based program in one of the dorms at this prison. And instead of having just all faith-based people working there, they had other people. So they had this guy who was hostile to the faith, actually, working side by side with another counselor. And, um, you know, I remember interviewing him, and he said, you know, I, I get down and dirty with these inmates. I can out-cuss all of them, and I just tell them the way it is. And, you know, it's a very angry, bitter person. And I said, well, what do you think about this faith-based program that's just started here? He says, it's a crock. It's going to get someone killed. These Bible-thumping people don't know what they're doing. They're not trained. They're a hazard. And there is some truth to that, by the way. Uh, some of these people really hadn't received the training that they needed. But I did come back six months later and interview him. And it was a little different. 
Then about six months later, I come back and I interviewed everybody, inmates and staff. I interviewed this guy and he just seemed to have a smile on his face. And you know, every other word wasn't a four letter word. And so I interviewed some inmates. I said, what's going on with so-and-so? He goes, he's completely changed. He has completely changed. He's, he's turned into a nice guy. I, I, he doesn't treat us bad anymore. He treats us like we're human beings. So I talked to the person he shared an office with, and they said, well, I was talking to his wife the other day, and she said, we don't know what's happening, but he's, he's different. He's different at home. And so I interviewed him, and he said, well, you know, I saw all these faith-based people talking to these people, and they were sharing scriptures with them and saying, here's why this is happening, and here's how you should react according to scripture, and blah, blah, blah. And I saw this one person consoling someone who had lost a parent, and he said, so I've been using scripture on the inmates. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, that's, this is really interesting, you know. Here's a guy that by his own definition is not religious at all. Um, but what had happened over a year, the program had had an effect on him. And um, he, he, he saw that they were actually making headway, that if you treat people with respect, it goes a long way instead of, you know, getting down and dirty, as he had said a year earlier. So it's just, it's just a, a little story of how people of faith coming into an environment where they hadn't been before helping to change. And I think this is why these partnerships can be synergistic. Yeah, let me say that. I, I think with conservatives, um, uh, you're talking about saying, unfortunately, too many conservative scholars writing about welfare only emphasize restrictions. You know, uh, only emphasize restrictions, and, and you know, and, and that's and the other the other piece is what kids are looking for is a is a meaning. When we are able to transform, we had 53 murders in a five square block area in Benning Terrace, just you know, about that four uh, four miles from here. The police were afraid to go into the community. We work with five faith based. Uh, faith-oriented faith ex-offenders who had the trust and confidence of the kids. And, and I said, but well, your, your, your trust is diffused, so we can't measure it. Why don't you concentrate in one neighborhood? They said, where? where? And then a 12-year-old boy was killed in Benning Terrace, you remember, 19 years ago. I said, well, God has made the choice for you. So they brought, I said, go in that neighborhood and bring those gang members up to my office on DuPont Circle. So they went in and they brought eight members because they were trusted. They brought 16 into my office, and uh, and I told people they we searched them. They had bulletproof vests on, but it's fine to be faith-centered, but don't be foolish. And so we searched them, but they said none of us, no one has ever asked us to be peaceful, because what these young men were looking for is a sense of mission, a sense of content and purpose to their lives that they found in gangs and in violence. But once we offered them an alternative purpose and mission, they took it because it, they transformed not only themselves but their whole community. And we went down to zero gang murders for 12 years in that community and we've taken what they, we learned and exported and that became our violence free zone. And, and Arthur and the other panel said something important is that Poverty isn't just being broke. There is there are poverty of the spirit. And many of your evangelical kids are leaving the church in droves because they look at it as it's almost as if they're pharisaic. They're Pharisee churches because all we're emphasizing to the kids what they shouldn't do. Don't be gay. Don't be don't don't have sex out of marriage. All of these prohibitions but we're not telling them what they should become and giving them, that's why ISIS is able to recruit among disaffected kids because they're giving them a sense of purpose. In Plano, Texas, white middle-class kids are becoming gummers. They're chewing pure heroin, which is a high addictive form. In, in uh, Orange County, uh, California, the Aryan Nation are recruiting among those kids. And so, what we've got to do, we have found what our grassroots leaders in those communities, they have mastered the ability to remoralize these kids, give them a sense of purpose which inoculates them from the demonic influences of an ISIS or gangs or anything else. And so if they can transform people in these toxic, drug-infested, crime-ridden neighborhoods, they can do something for the kids in Plano, Texas 
or in Orange County. But so we need to talk about partnerships, not just to help those people over there, but America needs to be remoralized and we're sinking. And I think the new patriots are coming from these low income, high crime, drug infested neighborhoods. If we can just sit down together and talk about resource sharing, and I, because if we're going to protect ourselves against the external enemy that's tr coming in, we've got to be united the way we were during the Second World War against fascism. We must be united. Okay. All right, so we've got some questions from the audience, and they all, a couple of them uh, center around an issue that, that I want to come back to and that uh, keep focusing on that, and that is the relationship between the state and civil society. And sometimes uh, uh, Arthur's rhetoric about making peace with the safety net is directed at the right, saying uh, you've got to recognize there is a role for government. And I wondered in the evangelical community, from either of your perspective, whether you think we're making progress in getting that reconciliation to the state. And if not, what more do we have to do from uh, the, the more uh, people from the more the right or the, the, the conservative world? Wow. Well, events like this that aren't going to draw like the one next door, um, if we could Which draw like that. Well. Yeah, it's, it drew pretty well. Um, th these are important. I think one of the things that academics can do that we don't do a good job of is to write in different ways. Let's face it, you know, we write articles in journals that nobody reads. And um, so we need to make a, a real effort to make sure that our information gets into the pews uh, where everyday people actually live so they can hear messages like that. Um, we're starting a newsletter called News for the Pews where we put social science data in front of pastors. I think many pastors are well-intentioned, but sometimes their facts are just way off base. You know, like here's one fact I heard a, a pastor say, uh, and, and some of you would know him because he's a household name, that atheism has grown tenfold in the last 30 years and tries to create a panic around that. Atheism is at 4% and it's been there for 70 years. <laughs> and, and so, you know, th th there is bad information that gets into the pews um, and we need to make sure that people are hearing the kind of conversation uh, that Arthur and Jim just had. I think that's so useful. I mean, we have a, a tendency to pigeonhole people and I think people would be surprised that Jim Wallace and Arthur Brooks have much, much more in common. And uh, there's a tendency for us to, you know, kind of write off people, to write off the government. Um, and I don't think that we can afford to do that. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I'm trying to tell these faith-based groups is you do need to evaluate what you're doing. And, and if you go after a grant, they're gonna make you evaluate what you're doing. That's a good thing, that's not a bad thing. So um, I think there's a lot that, that the government can learn from these entrepreneurs like Bob Woodson. Um, but there's, it, it goes both ways. So I think we just need to do a better job of communicating, writing more popularly, um, you know, writing for uh, you know, newspapers, op-eds, and things like that that will communicate more effectively um, how this could work better um, because we have to. And then I think churches, uh, for all their faults, and, and Bob was correct in what he said, but Study after study confirms that church attendance is about the most protective thing out there uh, if you look in the social science literature. So somehow, uh, people who go to church fare a lot better on all kinds of indicators, mental and physical health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think one of the things uh, that the churches do is that they, um, either through mentorship, through networks of support, through teaching, through Bible study, they create character. We know that character matters. We know that tenacity matters, perseverance, and self-control. I mean, we have a whole new wave of research, by the way, in neuroscience now looking at self-control, and it shows how dramatic, they don't call it that, by the way, they have another term for it, but you and I know it's self-control. Um, uh, this is a spiritual concept. It works. And I think that, that, that churches are this huge repository of goodwill, but they could be doing so much more. 
And I think that we just need to be able to put some, some talking points in front of congregations so that when you, congregations don't say, here's how you can help us. You can do nursery, you can work in the parking lot, and help us park cars, or you can be an usher, you know. No, we, we, we need people to be able to say, you know, we need accountants to help us because we got this program that we're doing that's teaching, you know, business skills. Mm -hmm. You know, we have attorneys and we have other people. We want you to help us transform the community where our church is located. Um, you don't see that very often in a church. And so uh, it's not that they're trying to be a skunk at the picnic, but sometimes they don't know how to, do, to move forward and, and we need to, to be a little bit more intentional about how the church could help us. We have about 370,000 churches. That's a lot of churches. Mm -hmm. And they're already doing remarkable things. When we study kids in poverty, we, we find that the, the difference maker for many of them is whether or not not if they have two parents, that's important, but whether or not they are raised and embedded in the church. Um, and these, these networks of support are, are helpful. And the last thing I'm gonna say on this is the coolest thing that we're now finding with all the research. It's important to be the beneficiary of social support. It's helpful. It helps you live longer and a more vital life. But what's even better than being the beneficiary of social support is giving. Those people who give social support are, come out the best. And, and, and so the, 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 the scripture says it's better to give than to, re to receive. Now all the social science, the neuroscience, all of it is confirming that this is actually a fact. And so this, is, this helps us with our, our, our marching orders. We need to be serving others. And by doing so, we're actually helping ourselves. Just a quick response. Uh, I don't think anyone is going to lay down their lives on foreign soil for uh, lower taxes, limited government, <laughs> uh, and strong defense. The role of government, we, and, and I think it's a false dichotomy to see either governments, all, all government's bad and all private is good. I can show you some powerfully corrupt and incompetent multi-million dollar social interventions strictly of the private sector that has done more injury than anything government has. So, and I've seen some government, we have a $1.9 million contract with the Milwaukee school system that we've had now for eight years that is dramatically reducing violence in our schools 25% in the first three months. Byron has evaluated that, that is uh, dramatically uh, increasing civil order. So it's not government in or out and as, as the other panel said, we need to keep the, the face of the people we are trying to help central to whatever we do and say, is this good or bad for that person or this group? Not whether government is good or bad, but is this, whatever we're doing, is it effective and competent? So one of the questions I'm getting concerns the individual and how they, an individual parishioner or, or member of a congregation, can get involved or contribute in a positive way, and you two both have been involved in this. How, what would you say to someone in that regard? I said, first of all, I think come with an attitude of service. The biggest barrier that I find is not race, is elitism. That with our education, we have made, we become intellectual imperialists. We assume that if we meet people uh, and they speak and they break verbs, dangle participles and split infinitives, they're not wise and therefore less than us and so we must rescue them. Uh, and, but if you come with that attitude, I say stay home. But if you come humbly uh, to help, and you're willing to be on tap, but not on top always, then you can be useful to people. But you must come with that attitude. I always come with the attitude that I'm going to receive as much as I'm going to give. After all, reciprocity is fundamental to any respectful relationship. Unfortunately, we treat the poor as if they're impotent children, only capable of receiving our largesse. When we ought to go there with the attitude that I expect something in return for what I receive, and that's where dignity flows in that relationship. So you can help people with the that you don't, they don't have to sacrifice their dignity, dignity as a condition of your assistance, then by all means, go for it. So 
One of the other things that came up in the previous conversation had to do with wages and had to do with uh, corporate uh, uh, profits and, 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 and dollars not passing down into workers. What is the role of the evangelical community in talking to businesses, uh, large corporations in America, about um, a different allocation of their resources as opposed to dividends or customers? What about the workers? And do, 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 do the evangelical community in that game? I don't, I, I'm not sure how well they're in that game. I gave you one example of something that I'm aware of, this, this program called the Prison Entrepreneurship Program, which is a complete paradigm shift. You know, typically people are thinking about when a guy gets out of prison, I don't know if you know this or not, it's hard to get a driver's license. Uh, for, for some of them, transportation is just a huge problem. If they got a job, they, how would you get to work? Um, completing a job application, you know, or for even housing is a problem. So we have all these basic problems. And then, so you're trying to figure out how do you help these people in a position, what can evangelicals or uh, people of faith do? And then now you have these businessmen that come up with this idea, we'll, we'll start them businesses. I mean, this is, this is again, I think that's the kind of genius that's possible um, if, if, if we're willing to kind of go. And, that, you know, if you talk to these businessmen, they'll tell you, again, that they're the beneficiaries. I talked to one businessman in Houston. He's not even a believer. Ninety percent of his employees are former offenders. And he said, I don't do it out of a mission. I'm not, I'm not a religious person. I do it because these people are great workers. And he goes, some people come out of college and then we have to completely reorient them when we get here because of the way they've learned things. These guys come and we say, this is the way it's going to be. This is how we like to do it. And they do it. That's why we keep hiring these ex-cons. So <clears throat> I just think that's one example, and it's a precious small example, of ways that we need to completely change the conversation. Um, I mean, one of the things that I know about ex-offenders, because I've been studying them for so long, is their lives are very fragile. And so for some of them, uh, they, if, if they have a bad day, that could lead to another mistake, and then the next thing you know, it's a relapse, and it's a spiral, they're back in prison. Uh, they didn't expect it to happen, they didn't want it to happen. Uh, a lot of people think, well, that's the only thing they know. They want to go back to prison. They didn't want to go back to prison. Um, so um, I think that this is why we, we need to, you know, figure out creative, innovative ways. Again, I'm not the guy that dreams these things up. I just like to go in there and look at them and study them. But that's the kind of model I think that we really need, kind of a turning it upside down model where we think about people not only um, making it on the outside but thriving. Bob, you've been spending a lot of time with the great powers in Washington. How, are you having any sense that the corporate world is getting to recognize that wages aren't rising? Uh, or is there any hope? And are you sense any role in that debate? Well, I don't think poor people are poor because rich people are rich. Uh, and and I think there, as Arthur said, we must we must have the uh, summon enough courage to speak to poor people as if they're human. When I, it bothers me when someone says I have three children and I can't raise them on minimum, on minimum wage, then perhaps someone needs to say, don't have three children. Someone has to say to people, have the number of children you can afford, but not, and so, and I think it's important for ha us to say that, but also I think it's important to uh, as business people, to promote entrepreneurship. We have a, a man in, in, in uh, Indianapolis, uh, Kurt Moore, who comes out of a congregation there, 13 years in federal prison and uh, uh, in a high crime area. And Kurt came out, um, he's one of these people who found Christ in prison and brought Christ with him. I tell people, if you leave Christ at the gate, he'll be there when you come back. <laughs> But, but Kurt brought him out with him, and now Kurt started washing cars, uh, and now two years later he has 15 people working for him. And, and, and so what we've done is connect him with a, some business leaders who are helping him with access to capital, how to better manage the business, how to grow it, and there are 10 other Kurts in that. So we really need to um, be more imaginative about how do we actually intentionally reach into those communities to promote job generation from within. 
a uh, young man who, uh, uh, in, there's no cab service in Ward 7 and 8, because of the, but it's a highly dense area. We're trying to take some ex-offenders and start a cab company, because once your character changes, your characteristic has an advantage. No one is going to rob those cabs. <laughs> <laughs> And so that means if they can drive taxis in those areas, and they can deliver food, and they can be the eyes and ears. And so we just have to begin to look at the people in these communities for their assets and their capacities, and, and then take the, the instruments of our free enterprise system and make them available to these Josephs in these communities so that we can create new generations of, but, but it is, George, George Bernard Shaw asked the rhetorical question, must a Christ die in torment in every age to save those that lack imagination? We just lack imagination in, a, in trying to come up with remedies. And that means we've got to look at the people suffering the problem as if they've got capacity and they've got the will to achieve what they're looking for is the way. But if we continue to look at them as victims as someone over there, then we'll never get beyond uh, where we are today. And I think there, the issues that I just laid out, I think, are beyond, it's trans-political, it's trans-ideological, and I really think that's what the American pu public are thirsting for, are remedies that don't address either of the extremes but deals with the sensible 60% who are, of Americans are truly looking for remedies to these problems that addresses the needs of the least of these. I was just gonna say one thing to follow sure. on that. Um, in Dallas, there's a very wealthy community next to SMU. And if any of you have been to Dallas, you know the area I'm talking about. That's only a, a mile or so from West Dallas, a couple of miles from West Dallas. And I was talking to a development person not too long ago, and he said, you know, there is more money. He's, he was talking about philanthropy. There is more money than you can imagine in Dallas. And for those of you that are in development, you know what I'm talking about. He said, there is more guilt than you can imagine <laughs> in Dallas. I.e., there's a lot of rich people there. And they see that over the distance, not far, is this poverty. They feel guilty about it. They don't know what to do. They've, they've not been in there. That's why I'm thinking, you know, when you have a Bob Woodson that's willing to take someone and show them, they then understand what's actually going on in that community for the first time. So they don't have to just feel guilt. They can actually be a part. And so I think that's the thing that so often that um, well-meaning evangelicals have not been exposed to the conditions uh, that I think sometimes open their eyes, and that reminds me again of the discussion that happened uh, before our panel. So I think that, you know, just getting out and understanding, that's why I think it's good to mentor kids. You know, you, you get exposed to a lot of these things, and um, it can be very helpful. Just one comment, and that is, there, there are, what we do at the center is screen and, and, and assess people too, because poverty does not ennoble anybody nor does suffering ennoble anyone. There are some hustlers in communities just as there's hustlers among rich folks. So it's important for us to vet the people that we bring to the table. I don't want to over romanticize that. Thank you. This has been a great discussion. We've been at it a long time and I want to thank our two guests and have all of you thank them too.